The inexplicable array of evidence in the historical artifacts points out an advanced path in the past and, at least, the remembrance of advancements and the surviving artifacts from the dawn of time as we know it could be the clues to the before time and with this we see the undertaking to document their previous existence in a physical form. When the last cataclysm occurred it destroyed everything, the lot. This is why we are hard pressed to remember the time before the cataclysm because in physical form very little is still visible from this period and no clear documentary evidence exists from this time before time. But from the fragmentary evidence that does still survive, we can attempt to understand the goings on in ancient times and the exact happenings that triggered cataclysmic events and indeed a dangerous extinction level event that almost ended the human struggle. What happened exactly is up for debate. We know there were floods and earthquakes, tsunamis and supervolcanoes going off all over the place. We know there was a comet impact, but did the comet impact trigger the other events in a domino toppling type effect? Was it a comet or could this initial impact have been something else? In the Masula Purva, we find this singular description, which must have been incomprehensible to 19th century ethnologists though not to us today, which reads, It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Vershnis and the Adhakas. The corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. Their hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without any apparent cause, and the birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected, the thunderbolt was reduced to a fine dust. And again, Kukra flying on board a high-powered Vimana hurled onto the triple city a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe. An incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns rose in all its splendor. When the Vimana returned to Earth, it looked like a splendid block of antinomy resting on the ground. Could a weapon really have existed in ancient times that was capable of such destruction? Could we be mistaking these accounts of this weapon in modern times? And could it have inadvertently triggered other world events during these epic times? Such a weapon is known to the Hindus, the description of the Brahmastra as being a singular weapon charged with all the power of the universe was known to the ancient Indian cultures and indeed these epics could be accurate historical data based on survivor accounts of these events. Other accounts of a weapon which has such power is also found in the accounts of Buddha. According to legend, Buddha took the Vajra weapon from Indra and forced its wrathful open prongs together, thus forming the peaceful Buddhist scepter with closed ends absorbing and sealing within the unbreakable and indestructible power of the thunderbolt. The Vajra is the quintessential symbol of Vajrayana Buddhism, which derives its name from the Vajra itself. This is the supreme path of Buddhism, the thunderbolt or diamond wisdom, seen both open and closed to represent the weapon having being used and being ready for use. The Dorje represents the highest spiritual power, that which is irresistible, invincible, indestructible, and inexhaustible, free from conflicting emotions. The term Vajra is a Sanskrit word that is usually defined as diamond or thunderbolt. It also defines a kind of battle club that achieved its name through its reputation for hardness and invincibility. According to Ancient Origins Online, it first appears in ancient India where it was the primary weapon of the Vedic sky god Indra, the king of the Divas. According to the Hindu Puranas, the evil Asuras, Namuchi and Viritra removed all of the light and moisture from the earth and made the land inhospitable to living beings. Indra battled the demon gods unsuccessfully and as a last resort called upon the supreme god Vishnu for help. 
Vishnu informed him that only a weapon that was neither solid nor liquid could kill Nam Uchi and the Ritra. Vishnu had the divine carpenter Tavashta fashion Indra, a marvelous weapon he could use to vanquish the dreadful Asuras. The new weapons, the Vashra, emitted thunderbolts. With it, Indra annihilated Nam Uchi and Varitra and returned the much needed light and moisture back to the earth. In the Rig Veda, it reads, Now I describe the glorious deeds of Indra, who holds Vashra. He killed the serpent and made waters flow. He broke the hearts of mountains. He killed the serpent, which was taking refuge in mountain. Tishvashta made the Vashra for him, like the cows making sounds, flowing waters reached the sea. Mighty Indra chose Soma and drank from three containers. Generous Indra held Vashra in his hand and killed firstborn among the serpents. As a hurled weapon, the indestructible thunderbolt blazed like a meteoric fireball across the heavens in a maelstorm of thunder, fire, and lightning. Maybe such a weapon from an advanced society, when described after the collapse of that society, could be mistaken for a comet strike. Maybe. Dahichi is a central character in Hinduism. Dahichi is primarily known for sacrificing his life so the Divas, or benevolent celestial beings, could make the weapon called Vasra from his bones. After being driven out from Savarga, or heaven, by the serpent king Varitra, the Divas needed a powerful weapon to aid their fight. By making the Vajra, made from the sage Dahichi's bones, the Divas defeated Asura and reclaimed heaven. The Vashra is made up of several parts. In the center is a sphere which represents Sunyata, the primordial nature of the universe, the underlying unity of all things. Emerging from the sphere are two eight-petaled lotus flowers. One represents the phenomenal world and the other represents the nominal world, Nirvana. This is one of the fundamental dichotomies which are perceived by the unenlightened. Arranged equally around the mouth of the lotus are two, four, or eight creatures which are called Makara. They are mythological half-fish, half-crocodile creatures made up of two or more animals, often representing the union of opposites or a harmonization of qualities that transcend our usual experience. From the mouths of the Makara come tongues which come together in a point. The five-pronged Vashra with four Makara plus a central prong is the most commonly seen Vashra. This is an elaborate system of correspondence between the five elements of the nominal side of the Vashra and the phenomenal side. One important correspondence is between the five poisons with the five wisdoms. The five poisons are the mental states that observe the original purity of a being's mind while the five wisdoms are the five most important aspects of the enlightened mind. Each of the five wisdoms is also associated with a Buddha figure. Many images of Zeus tossing thunderbolts show them as a rod, but there are several depictions that show Zeus with a Vasra, overwhelmingly suggesting a connection between the gods that are worshipped all over the world. Zeus had received the weapons from the hands of the fabulous Cyclopses, the men of the golden race, improbable creatures whose size reached 54 yards. The Cyclopses were the masters of lightning. They also mastered the art of ironworks and electronic engineering. They knew how to make terrible weapons, so they offered Zeus the weapon that made him almighty, the thunderbolt that kills or turns into God. The Vasra-like weapon also appears in Sumerian cosmology. Its use is recorded in the Babylonian epic of creation, the Enuma Elish. A battle between the sky god Marduk and serpent Tiamat is detailed on the fourth tablet of this ancient document. The evil and powerful Tiamat, according to the text, was devising treacherous plans against Enki and the other reigning gods. The gods were afraid to invoke her evil wrath and search for a solution. Inki attempted to confront Tiamat, but instead of fighting, backed down. 
Marduk, his son, stepped forward and volunteered to fight the enraged serpent on one condition. If he were successful, he would have dominion over the entire universe. The gods agreed and provided Marduk with mighty weapons, in particular the almighty thunderbolt weapon. Scholars contend that there is no relationship between India, Greek, Australian, and Norse mythology, nor the cosmology of the Americas. They believe that each civilization conceived of their gods independently and that a deeper, older, universal tradition does not exist. If this were the case, then the foundation of these societies, their myths, traditions, beliefs, and iconography should be unique to them their location and their history, the tales of war, intrigue, and conquest that comes out of American history are vastly different from those of England, France, India, and China. So too are the customs, traditions, and the symbols that represent the nation. Yet, when we look at a wide range of ancient and indigenous groups, a pattern of commonality exists. Myths and symbols found in India readily appear in the oral and written descriptions of other cultures. They also appear in their artistic images. These representations seem to transcend time and location. The symbol of thunder or a thunderbolt as a tool of destruction, for example, surfaces in many ancient civilizations. Mythology unfailingly associates lightning with a sky god, the god of thunder, who then uses it as a weapon. What do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching.